uh, as students, and um, it was a, a missions class, a Christian missions class, and, and it was kind of about like uh, missiology and about like exposing people to missions and, and helping people understand how to support and then how to also like go and do missions. Um, very cool class. But one of the coolest things for me, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was uh, when each of the uh, speakers would come, almost all of them had a lot of experience, like m sometimes many, many, many years um, in a different country as a missionary. And uh, one of the things that they did talk a lot about, either as in their personal story or, um, you know, as a topic, was like culture shock um, and how there's kind of different levels of culture shock. And if any of you guys here are from a different country and you're doing school in America, you probably can tell us a little bit about culture shock. But... Um, one of the things that I thought was funny was uh, some of them, you know, may have been from Russia and uh, certain parts in, in, in Russia, and, and they'd say, man, you just wanted to walk around and see somebody smile because they just don't do that there. Um, or then the opposite side of the spectrum, um, some, you know, really uh, primitive tribal cultures, uh, they may smile at you a lot, but come to find out they're, you know, they're, they're priding themselves on if they can lie to you and get you to believe them. And that's like, you know, how they kind of gain respect for each other. And so y y there's all these different cultures that we could go to and feel like totally different. And the point is, we would go there and we would know, all right, we're not from here. We have a different kind of birthplace of origin, right? And that's a little bit what we're going to talk about uh, tonight, and, and I think it's a little bit of, of what uh, John is talking about, is that uh, when a missionary goes to a country and is completely opposite of their culture, it's clear that they're from somewhere else. In the same way, when we are born new, when we are born into the family of God, we are now kind of given a new birthplace, so to speak. We are now going to be different than the world. And if we are born of God, if we are in God, if we are abiding in Christ, if we are part of the family of God, it's going to be obvious to other people and also to ourselves that we are different, that we have a different birthplace of origin, if you will. And so if you guys want to join with me, go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 2, verses 28, and then we're going to finish chapter 2 and go into, uh, go into chapter 3. It is also in the YouVersion app, if you have that as well. And I just want to read the first section, uh, verses 28 through 310, that we'll be looking at. It says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence, and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. All right, so that is our first section. And, and what I want to do before we kind of jump in and go a little bit deeper, I've got a fancy clicker tonight, first time ever, I think. Um, look at that, look at that. All right, so hopefully everybody can read that. <laughs> All right, so, um, so John, uh, John has a habit of repeating things. Some of you guys may already be tired of hearing him say, like, you know, basically, if you're a Christian, you should, like, love people or something, right? He's said that about 80 times. But um, anytime something's repeated, we know it's important. And I wanted to show you guys kind of just the, the structure and one of, one of the things that he, he emphasizes very strongly here um, in just our first section, so verses 4 through 7 and 8 through 10. Um, so verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning. And then verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning. 
Then he kind of defines where, what the origin of sin is. Sin is lawlessness. The origin of sin is the devil. Verse 5, he appeared in order to take away our sins. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. And then in verse 10, he kind of sums up these two things, and he's saying these in, in slightly different ways, but I wanted you to see the, the repetition here. In verse 10, he says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. And so we'll, we'll jump in here a little bit deeper, but what I want us to see is this kind of overall flow of thought. John is talking about two families here. The families of God, the family of the devil, and he's talking about the origin of sin, where it comes from, the reason why Jesus came, and what like the outcome of that is. And essentially, I think that what John is saying in here in, in this first section is that children of God act like children of God. And that's our first point, but let's, let's jump in and go a little bit deeper here. Back in chapter 2, verse 28. It says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. So John begins this next section kind of with some familial language, little children. That's always when you know he's being tender and it's kind of serious. But he says, little children abide in Jesus. And John goes on to reference Christ's second coming as a reason for why uh, we should pursue righteousness. He says, when Jesus appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And so because Jesus is righteous, we want to be righteous, and we also don't want to be caught off guard when Jesus returns, right? And I have a, children of God act like children of God, I have this right here, when your mom just arrived home and you had some chores to do, that meme always really gets me really anything with that girl. She's just like, she's really caught off guard. But we can all relate to that, right? Your mom is going out to run some errands or something. She gives you a huge list of chores, but it's easily done in like the time that she's going to be gone. And so naturally you, uh, you go and you watch TV and you fart around for about four hours and all of a sudden you hear something. And you're like, what is that? And you realize it's the garage door opening. Your mom just got home. And you haven't started any chores. So you run around like a ninja, and you're like doing a little bit of this, doing a little bit of this. And then you pick like a really high-profile chore, like vacuuming or like, like dishes. And so when she comes in, you're like, oh, hey, mom, I was just getting the dishes done. How are you? You need me to take some bags in, right? And so you're doing this whole charade, and you're just hoping that she doesn't dig a little deeper, right? And the problem is with Jesus, when Jesus returns, we're not going to be able to do that. And, and John wants us to be able to stand with confidence and say, Mom, I got my chores done, right? John, John wants us as believers to be able to stand with confidence and say, Jesus, I have been pursuing righteousness because I know that you are righteous and I am born of you. I am part of your family. And so that's what John wants for the believers. He says, little children, I want you to be confident when Jesus returns. And so um, the, moving into chapter 3 here, I want to read verses uh, 1 through 3. It says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So John kind of further introduces this idea of being a part of God's family. He says how great God's love is for us, that he would call us his children. And then he says, and so we are, just to emphasize the fact that when God says something, it's actually true. Thanks, John. Got it. Um, but it, he, he's, he's breaking into almost like a, uh, it's almost like a, a, a separate section of the flow of thought. He's like, wow, can you believe how great the Father's love is, that he would make us his children. And then in verse 3, verse 3 is kind of important here. It says, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So what he's saying here is, and sometimes it's helpful to kind of break down exactly what John's saying, because he kind of says a lot in, in a really quick way. But everyone who hopes in Jesus purifies himself as Jesus is pure. That's what he's saying. So since we hope in Jesus... We purify ourselves because we know that Jesus is pure. Now, this is awesome because it's not, we don't purify ourselves because we think we have to do it to earn something, 
And that's, that's the difference be, between why we have this hope in Jesus. Our hope is not in our ability to be able to purify ourselves, but our hope is in what Jesus has already accomplished for us. And that's why, because we know that we are secure, we know that Jesus has already accomplished that for us, we can pursue purity in freedom. It's a difference between maybe a, a son and a daughter who both want to be like their mother and father. And, and, and this, maybe the son is, is, is always trying to be like the dad, and, and, he's, and he's kind of forced into the hobbies and the sports that the dad likes, and, and he just, he's always under the critical eye of his father, always under a critical word, never able to really be good enough for his dad. Even in his successes, there's, there's always something to critique, and he just never feels like he can really please his dad. Some of you might be able to relate with that. But then it, it, the opposite is, is, is maybe like a mother who, who wants to be like her daughter, but, but she's able to, to, uh, to, she knows that her mother loves her no matter what, and so she's able to pursue different things and pursue different areas and, and essentially pursue being like her mother and her mother's character in freedom because she knows if she messes up, she knows if she picks a hobby that her mom doesn't like or whatever, that her mom is still going to love her. And that's the difference here. Because we have hope in what Jesus has already done, we can purify ourselves because he is pure. Not pursue righteousness and purify ourselves because we have to, or, or under threat of compulsion, or under threat of failure, or anything like that. Moving on into verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Now, when I first read this, I was kind of like, all right, what... What, is, what does this mean? What does lawlessness mean? Why are you, it seems kind of repetitive. Um, sin is lawlessness. And so I uh, looked into a, a little bit, dug a little deeper, and uh, I'm kind of just asking, like, what is, what is the difference? But I think what, what John is communicating here is that the root of sin is lawlessness. In other words, the root of sin is rebellion against God. And, and when we are in a state of rebellion against God, we are lawless, and then the result is sin. And, and this kind of flows with the pattern of thought that, that John is going through um, in, in kind of saying that you are what you do, or, you, or you, you, part of who you are is what you do. And, and John is saying, you know, if you're part of the family of God, you're going to purify yourself because your origin is, is God, and he is pure. But if you're part of, of lawlessness, if you're part of rebellion against God, then the result is sin. John continues on into chapter 5. He says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now, we have to be clear here. Um, John is not saying that someone who is of Christ or in Christ will never sin. He's not saying that that, that, that person will ever sin, or will never sin again. Um, I wanted to bring these up because one of the things that we have to remember is the things that John has already gone over in this book so far. Um, if John was saying here that, that once you're a Christian, you never, ever sin again, he would be contradicting himself in, in chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1, if we say we have no sin and we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. So basically John is saying, well, you're... You're kind of a liar. You're lying to yourself if you say that you have no sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So, so John is saying, hey, in the event that you sin, our Lord is faithful and just, and he will forgive us when we confess of our sins. And then John chapter 2, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so John is, is not saying that, that a Christian will never sin again. And so what he is explaining is that the general rule of, rule of thumb is that those who are of Christ, those who are in Christ, will, will not be categorized as a life of sin, or their life will not be looked at and defined as, uh, or by, by sin. Um, essentially what he's saying is that a life in Christ is incongruent with a life of sin, and that children of God act like children of God. Verse 7 says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So now we see kind of for the first time that, that John is apparently, um, apparently talking against a, a group of people who, who may wish to deceive uh, God's people. And, and what might they be deceiving them on? 
granted, uh, salvation by faith in Jesus lends itself to a specific type of heresy that some people call licentiousness. Licentiousness is, is, is basically the, the idea that you have a license to sin because you've been saved by grace. So since you're not saved by what you do, you can do whatever you want, right? There's kind of different levels of that. You can, you can be like a little bit licentious and, and, and it's still bad, but you can say, well, you know, my sin doesn't really matter that much because, you know, I'm saved by grace. I'm not saved by what I do. So my sin doesn't really matter that much. Or you could be on the way other end of the spectrum and you could be like, we can do whatever we want. We're good. And there actually were people in John's day, they were called the Gnostics, who claimed to have this higher knowledge of, of who Jesus was, a higher knowledge of God. And, and, and they did not live Christian lives. They did not, they did not pursue righteousness. They didn't pursue holiness. They, they didn't love one another. They were saved by their higher and superior intellect, their superior knowledge. And so John is saying, look, don't, that, that's a load of garbage. Don't, don't believe that. Anybody who is of God is going to be righteous. Anyone who practices righteousness is righteous as Jesus is righteous. He's like, don't, don't be fooled here. And then John uh, kind of concludes the section here, verses 8 through 10. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who the children of God are and who are of the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. My friends, what John is saying here is that children of God act like children of God. You act, each and every single one of you, act a certain way because of the family that you came from. Whether for good or for bad, and, and it's always a mix of, uh, of the two regardless, but you act and you live and you think and you do things all in a specific way, and most of that is because of the family that you grew up in. And this is what John is saying here, is that children of God act like children of God. Children of God act like their Heavenly Father. Children of God act like Jesus, who is righteous, Jesus, who is pure. Children of the devil do the opposite. And John makes it really clear here that there's only, there's only two sides. There's only one or the other. And this, this, is, this, is, our, this is our application from this point, is, is to know this truth. Children of God act like children of God, not under compulsion or threat or fear of failure or manipulation, but through the freedom and the hope and the new birth that we have through Jesus Christ. That's our application, to, to know that truth. Because we are children of God, we're not, we're not, we're not slaves of God, we're not under compulsion, we're not, uh, we're not children of a manipulative father or a, or a harsh mother or, or whatever it is that you may have in your mind that's not a great family, uh, family role model, but, but we're able to follow God, we're able to be like Jesus and imitate him, not under threat or compulsion, but in freedom and walk in righteousness, love in truth, and in freedom of who God has created us to be. And for further application of this point, if you, if you are a believer in this room tonight who has maybe felt the burden uh, of that, who, has, who your faith has maybe felt the burden of, of manipulation, maybe you're part of a bad church. Maybe, maybe you felt like your faith was, was really forced upon you and you're trying to just figure this all out. Maybe, maybe you feel like because of a bad presentation of the gospel or maybe just your own faulty understanding, you, you feel like God is an angry father and he's just waiting to, 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 to watch you mess up and he's just going to come down and get you. If, if, if that's you tonight, I, I want you to take a hold of this, of this promise that children of God act like children of God, but not under compulsion, not under manipulation, but in the freedom that only Jesus Christ can give us. And we can only have that freedom because Jesus already paid the debt. And so if that's you tonight, I want to ask you guys, this is a great verse. We talked about it in an officer meeting. Um, I want to ask you guys to, to, to memorize this verse, which should be super easy. Casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I want you guys to, to, to pray that verse and, and, and ask God to take away those, the, those feelings and those, those thoughts and those, the ways that you maybe relate to God um, feeling like God is an angry father or a manipulative mother or whatever it is, and, 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 
cast your anxieties on God and say, Lord, I don't, I don't want to view you like that anymore. I want to imitate you. I want to follow you in the freedom that you, have, that you want me to follow you in. And we have to remember here, chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Children of God act like children of God. Let's move into our next point here, verses 11 through 18. I want to read the section. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So you guys might be able to guess the point. It has something to do with love, right? Um, our, our point for this section is children of God love in action. Children of God love in action. Let's work through here. In, in verse 11, pretty simple, right? For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Um, it is important to realize that, that God is not a new God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's not a different God. This is a message that we've heard from the beginning. It may be, the, and it's, this, it's the same message, but it might be a new application. This is the same message you've heard from the beginning, is to love one another. And then verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own de deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So John moves into this illustration to, to show his point. This illustration is the story of Cain and Abel. Um, for those of you who know the story of Cain and Abel, you know that the root of his, uh, well, what was the root of Cain's, of Cain's anger and, and hatred that led to murder? Jealousy, jealousy. yeah. So uh, Cain's, Cain's jealousy was what lay behind his murder. It was a, a horrible cycle, jealousy, hatred, murder for Cain. And God even warned him along the way, but he said, nah, I'm still going to kill him. Um, and so jealousy, hatred, murder. And it's interesting because he wasn't jealous over anything that Abel had, right? I mean... It, we all know what it's like to be jealous over something that somebody else has. I mean, I'm really jealous of Caleb with a K's hat, and he wears it like every day, and I have to see it, and I really want it. And so if anybody ever got it for me, I'd be forever grateful. Um, but we know what it's like to be jealous, right? But he wasn't jealous over something that, that, uh, that Abel had. He was jealous over Abel's superior righteousness. It's kind of weird. But if you think about it, actually, it's the same type of jealousy that led the Pharisees to kill Jesus, right? I mean, they were poking holes in him, poking holes in him. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with Jesus. Spoiler alert, there was nothing wrong, right? But that's what made him so mad. And so they said, you know what? We're just going to kill him. We're just going to kill him. We're done with this. Same, it's the same exact type of jealousy. Verses 13 through 14. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipped a line. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. So here we see that, that John has used Cain as kind of a, a, a prototype for the world. And then he has used, uh, yeah, he's used Cain as, as kind of a prototype for the world and, and, and an example for the world. And not only did this story actually happen, but uh, but it serves as an example of those who will hate the children of God as well. And that, that's what John is saying here. Is that in the same way that Cain uh, hated Abel, there will be people in the world who hate believers in the same exact way, the same type of jealousy. And really, John is merely just echoing Jesus' words when he said in, in the Gospel of John, um, he said, it, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. Um, John also says that we may know that we are children of God by the fact that we do not have this same type of jealousy, right? He says, whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, 
and you know that a murderer has no eternal life abiding in him. Sorry, beginning of 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we, know, because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. And so he also says that we know that we are part of the family of God. We know that we are children of God when we don't have the same, the same thoughts and actions as Cain. When we have love as opposed to jealousy and hatred, that's part of how we know that we're part of the children of God. And then he also says that we have passed out of death into life. Um, this is a really cool imagery that's used all the time in Scripture. Um, Paul uses the same imagery to talk about baptism, passing out of death into life. In baptism, you're, you're put under the water, you're, you die. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a symbolic death, burial, and resurrection into new life. And John is talking about the same sort of thing here. When you, when you have this new life in Christ, you have the ability to then, to then pursue Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so because you have this new life, you have love instead of hate, light instead of darkness, life instead of death, and every other sort of uh, uh, analogy that John has in, in his really long book with lots of cool analogies. And uh, then moving on to verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Um, John is not talking about uh, murder being like some unforgivable sin. Obviously, it's like one of the worst ones that you could ever do. Um, but if you think about it, you know, Paul murdered lots of people, unfortunately, before he was converted. And even David, while he was a believer, uh, mur murdered uh, Uriah. And so we know that John's not saying that, but really what John is saying is he's using murder as, as an analogy for, for, for hate. Um, in the same way that Jesus used uh, when he talked about if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have already committed adultery with that woman in your heart. Uh, in the same way that Jesus kind of brought the outward sins into the inward level, John is using uh, murder as an analogy to say, if you hate somebody, you've already murdered them in your heart. And uh, essentially, that's what it is. When we hate someone, we want them to be gone, right? Verses 16 through 17, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So now we see that, that John has moved into a new example, a new prototype. Cain was the prototype for the world. Now we see Jesus is the prototype for the church, the example for the church. Verse 16, by this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So John makes this very practical. He's very focused on the practical in the end of this section, and it's because children of God love in action. In the same way that the world is, is, is modeled after Cain, or Cain is modeled after the world, uh, Jesus is the one that we imitate. Jesus showed his love by coming to this earth and dying for us. It was action. It wasn't just one thing. It was his whole life of action. And if God's love is shown to us in that way and it abides in us, it abides in us continually. And so our entire life should be characterized by love in action. By this we ought to know that we lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So this is kind of interesting because John first says, hey, you should like lay down your literal life for the brothers. I'm like, okay, cool. Even if we were ready to do that, most of us don't really get a chance to even do that, right? Even if, you, even if you're ready, even if you wanted to. Um, so John makes it practical in the everyday sense. If you see somebody who, who, who is in need, you should help them. But if you close off your heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Uh, C.S. Lewis said, I got the quote here. Oh. It is easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. <laughs> loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. That can, that can hit you pretty hard. And I think that that's what John is getting at here when he says, in the same way that Jesus laid down his life, you're supposed to lay down your life. You're supposed to be willing to give the ultimate sacrifice, but you're also supposed to be loving in an everyday sense. In the same way that we should care about, about large injustices in the world and, and major, major problems and that we should love everybody, we should really be loving people around us 
And if we don't love people around us, if we don't share the world's goods with them, John asks plain and simple. He says, if you close your heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? That's pretty serious. How does God's love abide in us if we can't even help people on a very small everyday basis? Coming off of this statement about those in need, I think John, John begs this question. He says, how could, how could God's love abide in, in you? If, if, if the death of Jesus Christ is, is that same love that is supposed to be in us, how could it be in us continually if we don't do that? How many of you can relate with this? When you see your childhood enemy. Can you guys see that? You guys have seen that meme before, right? The little sneaky little raccoon. When you see your childhood enemy, how many of you guys had maybe a childhood enemy or a childhood rival? Yeah, come on. You know you did. Uh, my earliest childhood rival, like vivid memories for me. I was pretty young. I remember it all started because we were competing for like the top church play roles, and it was vicious. It was vicious. And at first we like kind of both got these little solos, and, uh, and, and then like he got this bigger role, and because of that, like he got another bigger role. And Whereas at one point we were neck and neck, and then he was like into stardom. I mean, it was, he was gone, but I, I really, I did not like him. I don't know if I knew what hate was, but I may have hated him for a young kid. And we also were in sports together, and somehow we were always like pitted against each other. And uh, I remember so many interactions where we would be together, and we'd have this little kid pack, and we'd be bragging about who could count higher, you know. And he'd say, oh, I could count to 250, and I'd say, well, I can count higher. And, I, and he said, well, pre and... I specifically remember him saying, well, I, I know how to spell pizza. And I said, well, I do too. And he said, well, prove it. And I said, well, I want to know if you can spell it. And I'm pretty sure neither one of us knew how to spell pizza. <laughs> and to be fair, you know, we were young kids, like 14, 15. So, um, <laughs> but obviously I was a child. I was very young, like five, six, seven, eight. Um, but the point is, it's pretty infantile. But a lot of these same thoughts and attitudes follow us into our adult life as well. And if you would have, if you, if you would have you know, asked me how I felt about him, I probably wouldn't have said that I hated him. I probably wouldn't have thought to, of myself as, as somebody who is walking in the way of Cain, and, and, I'm, and I'm jealous of him, and I hate him, and I've committed murder against him in my heart, right? And I didn't say his name, but if for some weird reason you happen to listen to this on our YouTube site, no hard feelings, bro. Um, but, but I probably wouldn't have considered it, it to that level, right? But as an adult, I, I know how to hate, right? I know what it feels like to, to be jealous and to let it go to that next level. I know what it feels like to withhold love from people. I know what it feels like to be malicious. And if you would have asked me as, as a child if I loved him, I would have said yes because it was the correct answer. But... But here's the question. I want to read verse 18 and then, and then have a question to end this section. He says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Here's the question that I want you guys to, to sit with from this section. Does more of your headspace, is more of your headspace filled up with, with thoughts of hate or thoughts of love? Is more of your, your headspace uh, contain jealousy or self-sacrifice? I mean, seriously, that's, that's a big one. Does it contain more jealousy or self-sacrifice? <laughs> Do you spend more time thinking about um, big-scale problems in the world than you do about the problems that you see around you every day that you refuse to do something about? These are the questions I, I think that we need to be asking as we, as we, as we end in this section here because John says, look, little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth because children of God love in action. And that's part of how we know that we are children of God, when we love in action. The story of Cain and Abel is uh, both a description of how the world will feel towards us, but it is also a warning of, of the fact that we should not go down that path. All right, we're going to read through our last section here for the night, verses 19 through 24. It says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. <laughs> Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. 
And this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, and the spirit whom he has given us. So our point for this last section is that children of God can have peace. One of the things that we talked about as we, as we introduced this sermon series is that, um, is that the first John is a lot about assurance. He, and, and, and you notice there's like five or six statements that are kind of like, by this we shall know. Or if you are abiding in Christ, then you'll know this. And in fact, this section, the, the first uh, sentence and the last sentence both, end, both start with a, by this we shall know that we are of the truth type statement. And so John is talking about a lot of assurance here. He's talking about how we can know that we have peace and security and assurance before God. Now, let's read verses 19 and 20, and then we'll jump into those. It says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Now, this is kind of a confusing couple verses, these first three um, and I promise you guys I read like a half dozen commentaries trying to figure out what it was. Luckily, most of the commentators agreed on the message. They agreed on what John was trying to say. And most of the discussion was kind of around the fact that the Greek was very, very hard to translate into the English. Um, most passages are not like that, but there are a few where they just will argue till Jesus comes home on how to translate it into English. This is one of those. And so if the, the language just sounds a little weird when you're reading through, that's why. Um, but let's, let's, uh, let's jump into kind of exactly what, what John is saying here. So that's pretty much what John is saying. He's talking about this right here. You're happily living in the freedom of Christ, and then all of a sudden that doubt comes in. It's like, well, but do you know? Do you really believe enough? Or do you, do you, do you, are you sure that you're really living for Jesus? How many of you guys have ever felt like that? All of a sudden you just you really get attacked with these, these doubts. You, you get attacked with these doubts that, that you're not good enough. Or you get attacked with doubts and you're like, man, did I, did I really believe when I professed you know, at, at church a couple years ago? Or, or when I was a kid, did, did that really count? And, and you get attacked with these, these questions. And, and what John is saying is he's, he's talking about this scenario. And, and so he's giving us two ways to combat against that. Verse 19, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. So and then he says, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. So it's, he's talking about when our heart, our own heart condemns us, when our own heart is, is essentially attacking us and telling us that we're not good enough, we're not worthy, we didn't maybe truly believe, or whatever it is. And John is giving us two ways to combat against that, two ways that children of God can have peace. So the first is, in the beginning, he says, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before God. Well, by this we shall know what? By... What is the by this? Why is, that, why is that there? Well, he's talking, he's referring back to the previous section. And so he's saying, by the fact that we, are, that we love in, not just in word and talk, but in deed and in truth. And so basically what John is saying here is that, that because of the fact that we love in action, we know, we can know, that is part of our assurance that we are children of God. Now, John isn't saying that because we are perfectly loving or perfectly righteous, then we know that we've been born again. But he's saying that when we look at our lives, we can see that the love of Christ has been planted inside of us and it is made manifest by our actions. It is something that is consistent in our lives. And John is saying you can look back at that and that can be part of your assurance to know that you are part of God, that you are part of Christ, that you are in Christ. And John goes on to explain the fact that God knows everything. The, the second half of that, that section, he says, for whoever, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. So essentially, I think what John is saying, and this is what most of the commentators um, said as well, but uh, essentially what John is saying is that, that when we do something that is, maybe we do something that's good, and then we come back home and we think, man, I didn't have the perfect attentions with that. My intentions were a little bit bad, actually. Or maybe you do something and you're like, ah, oh, I could have done it better. I didn't really love that person as much as I could have. I really could have just done a little bit more. And, and what John is saying is that, that God, is, God is bigger than those doubts. God is bigger than our heart that, that wants to eat away at us. And John knows that if, if Satan is, is a lion that is prowling, 
ready to destroy us, right? And if the biggest way that he can attack us is through our own heart, through our own doubts and insecurities, he's going to do just that. And so John is saying God knows everything. He knows all of the intricacies of every single little situation. And he knows that even when we do righteous things, we cannot even do those perfectly. And he's saying God is, God is, God is okay with that. Uh, God knows that we have an advocate in Jesus. God is bigger than those doubts. Verse 21 says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So when I first read this, I thought that this was maybe like an either-or type of scenario, like there's, you're either in the section where your heart is condemning you, or you're in the section where like your heart isn't, and so then you get to pray to God. Um, apparently that's not really what, what this is saying, and, and, and uh, what it is, is uh, more of what it is saying is that it's kind of a, a step one, step two. And so essentially, if your heart is condemning you, then you can know that God is greater than that, and you can look back to your, your, to your uh, life of, uh, that is uh, epitomized by love, and you can have assurance of the fact that you are in Christ, and then you can be, and then you can, you can uh, have confidence, and then you can go before God in confidence and in prayer. And so it's not like an either or thing or something like that. And then verse 22, it says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And so uh, keeping God's commandments here, John is kind of saying is, is the, um, almost the prerequisite for God hearing and answering our prayers, which at first you might be like, I don't know about that. It sounds kind of harsh. Uh, but it makes sense because if, uh, if we are keeping God's commands, if we are pursuing righteousness, then what we will be asking for and what we will be praying for will be within the will of God. And so then, of course, God will give us the desires of our heart, just like Jesus said. And so John is saying if we, if we keep God's commandments, if we love, we can have confidence to approach God in prayer and know that he is going to answer our prayers. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Last couple verses here, verses 23 and 24. It says, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So essentially what John is getting at here as he wraps up this section is that no one can claim to abide in Christ if they do not follow his commands. Namely, as John has stated here, professing that Jesus is the Son of God, loving one another, and keeping his commandments. So he's saying, if, if somebody can't do those three things, or doesn't have those three things evident within them, then they cannot claim to abide in Christ. And we have to, uh, we have to keep in mind here that, that John is speaking against those who would do exactly the opposite of that. We have to keep in mind he's speaking against people who would, who would twist what Jesus' words were and, 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 and twist uh, God's message of the gospel into licentiousness and idolatry. Um, but if we doubt and we need assurance and peace, uh, we simply need to look at the Spirit's work in us, which allows us to believe in Christ. And that's part of what John is saying here. He says, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. The Spirit is the New Testament mark of salvation. If we have the Spirit, we know that we're saved. And the mark of the Spirit are the three things that John has previously mentioned. The ability to believe. The Spirit enables us with the ability to continue to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And also, it gives us the ability to pursue righteousness and the ability to love. And so, the mark of the Spirit are those three things. So when we doubt, that's what we need to look for. When, when our own heart condemns us, when, when, when Satan is, is trying to get at us and tell us that we're not worthy, that we're not good enough, whatever it is, we need to look at those three things, and then we need to look at Jesus and know that he's already paid it all. Okay? So if we doubt, that's, that's, that's where we need to go. And, you know, I think to, so often when we think of, um, of having assurance, we think of faith, or when we have assurance of our faith, we think of belief and like works as like either or situations. Like, like probably when you have doubts, most of you are in one camp or the other. You're either in one camp and you're like, man, I just, I don't know if my faith is strong enough. And you have all these doubts, like whether you truly are believing or whether your faith is strong enough or whether it was legitimate when you were baptized or, or whatever it is. And then uh, the rest of you are on this side where where you're like, man, I don't know if I'm doing quite enough. 
Like I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to do something, but I, I don't know if I'm doing enough to be abiding in Christ, right? That you're probably in one side or the other with those doubts. And both of those are bad because one, the first, leads to kind of like an ever unconfirmed uh, question. You know, you're just, you're just asking a question that never really has an actual answer. And then the other leads you towards a, a very unhealthy version of workspace salvation. And, and, and both are, are really, really bad. And so when, when we doubt, uh, what we need to do is, is exactly what John says. John tells us to look to the Spirit's work in us. He intertwines these two things, belief in Jesus and and are, are the, the works of the Spirit that are through us, which is righteousness and love. And don't hear me wrong, when we talk about salvation, there is, a, there is an order where we see that, that, uh, that belief comes first and then works. But as far as assurance is concerned, John tells us to look to both. He tells us that it is the Spirit's work in us that allows us to believe and allows us to continue to pursue righteousness and love. And he says, look at those three things, and that's how you can know that you abide in Christ. We'll never be perfect this side of heaven, my friends, but we can be confident that we're in Christ because children of God can have peace. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have been given peace through God. When we are in the family of God, we act like we are a part of that family. We love in action and can have peace before the Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the ability to be here tonight and study your word. God, we thank you for John and, and just the unique way that he decided to, um, to convey your message to us. Um, we thank you for all of the, the unique ways that he has, um, he has uh, hit different issues and, and topics. And God, we thank you for caring enough about us to know that we uh, would have doubts sometimes as to whether we're actually abiding in you. And God, I thank you for uh, for imploring John to write about how we can have assurance in, in our faith in you and in, in uh, the fact that we are your children. And Lord, I thank you for your love and your sacrifice on the cross. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.